I'm Annie Murphy and I'm the director of the Framingham History Center and I have to say it's a pleasure to be in such a spacious place <laughs> where we don't hear the door creak open and wonder where they're going to sit and yeah. So in any case, um, our last program I think we had, I don't, anybody from the town block your ears, I think we had about 85 people in the Edge of Library which was not fun. So we're here and I'm glad there's plenty of room. Um, I just wanted to um, say that I have been remiss lately when I introduce our programs to say that we are indeed, the Framingham History Center is not a town agency. We are supported by your membership dues, donations, grants, and bequests. And the reason I am going to get back on this bandwagon is I was having a conversation with my son-in-law and he thought we were a town agency. I was like, oh my God, I've got to do a better job of this. Um, but in any case, this program today is um, a creation of Charlene Frary, who is a board member here at the Framingham History Center. And I think she's been wanting to do this program for many years. But, and I'm going to give her some flowers now because I always forget at the end of the program. So Charlene, here's for you. You're welcome. Thank you thank for you. putting this together. And thank you all and speakers and everybody for coming. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, me and the Framingham History Center today for our Daring Dozen program in honor of Women's History Month here in Framingham. I have been incubating the seeds of this program for close to 15 years. And I'd like to tell you the tale of that because it's a story that plays out over and over and over at the History Center. And the name of this story is, One Project Leads to Another Project. So um, let's see, if we go way back to the turn of the century, doesn't that sound like that was so long ago, way back to the turn of the century, my Girl Scout troop was working on a project to restore the Civil War statue that was in front of the Edgel Memorial Library. And um, it's a Martin Milmore statue. Um, the tercentennial was also happening at the turn of the century. And my Girl Scout troop was, was doing this as a gift to the town. And um, the project took several years and it was successful. Um, local art conservator Rika Smith McNally was our conservator. And at the same time, um, the Minuteman was being conserved by the DAR. And um, it left one piece of outdoor public sculpture to be conserved at that same time. And that was, um, it's called the Peace Monument or the Victory Monument. Um, it was created by artist Emilius Champa and it's in a park that's located next to the courthouse on Route 126. So I sort of took this on as a personal project, not as a Girl Scout project, because I didn't want for two statues to be conserved and a third to not be conserved. And as anyone in this room knows, when you're applying for grants or trying to seek um, public support, it always helps when you make connections and collaborate with other groups. And so here I was, just south of Route 9, and I was trying to find a way to make a community connection with this piece of sculpture. And um, someone had suggested to me that I ought to think about Mita Fuller, um, for whom the Fuller Middle School was named. And they told me that Mita Fuller was a fairly famous, very famous sculptor. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> And I'm a Framingham native, uh, went to Framingham Public Schools, and sadly knew nothing about Mita Fuller. And no judgment, because I know that that happens lots of times in our community, where sadly the stories of great people are, are virtually unknown. And unfortunately, I think it is often a case where that's a, a woman's story. So I was mentioning to Lori Evans Daly what do you know about Mita Fuller? And she said, oh, Steve Herring just gave a talk at the Garden Club, and we're going back now to 2003. 
Steve Herring just gave a talk at the Garden Club, and he talked about 10 women in Framingham's past who he would nominate to a hypothetical Women's Hall of Fame. And she handed me an outline of, it was Steve's talk outline, and there was maybe two or three sentences about each of these really great women. And I read these two or three sentences about Mita Fuller, and I was off. And suddenly I was doing all this online research, and I was reading books, and I figured out where her house was and where her studio was, and I went out to see her artwork, and um, I became a raving fan uh, for Mita Fuller. And, you know, it was at a time in my life where um, I think I was trying to overcome some of my own personal barriers. I felt like with this project, I was kind of in way over my head. I didn't have the education to be able to pull it off. I was trying to break through that and learn. And um, I remember just knowing, knowing what I learned about Mita Fuller. You know, she had such barriers. She was a woman. She was a black woman and was able to break through those barriers and created some amazing art. And I remember when I went to go and look at her art, I thought, well, what was she able to do in that time period? And I, I don't know what I was expecting, ballerinas maybe, or something very feminine. And when you look at her artwork, her artwork is very raw and graphic with titles like The Talking Skull and The Wretched. And it was just amazing to me that she was able to break through those barriers and create the art that she felt so compelled to make. So I, I left this project with this two-page outline of all of these great women, and I thought, There's, we need to share these stories. There needs to be more <laughs> than a paragraph about all these fabulous people. And every once in a while at the History Center, I would bring it up, and um, we started publishing little bits of pieces um, over the past few years. And I reached out to Steve Herring again, and I said, Steve, you know, I have this outline, and you know, do you have any other information that you collected um, as part of doing that? And he said, oh, yes. I have the whole talk saved. Um, so what we would like to do today is we are going to re-deliver Steve Herring's fine work um, he wrote short biographies for the 10 women that he felt should be nominated to a hypothetical Women's Hall of Fame in Framingham. And after that, um, after we go through that, we decided at the History Center that since 2003, we had learned so much more about women in Framingham. Um, Libby Frank has done an amazing job of bringing um, the stories of many more Framingham women to life. And um, so what we thought we would do is, instead of just having 10, we were going to go to a dozen. And these would be our daring dozen. So we sought nominations from the public. And we received 11 new nominations, fabulous, fabulous women. And for the second half of our program, we're going to talk a little bit about them and invite people to share their stories. Um, we know a lot of you in the room knew the women who were nominated. And um, after that, we will announce who won our voting. So um, as we prepare to deliver Steve's talk, I have to kind of get in character a little bit here. He wore brown a lot. And I, I think actually I'm oops, making a fairly good uh, representation of Steve. <laughs> And please keep in mind when our presenters come forward, we have a fabulous um, list of presenters here today. They are reading Steve's words. Um, so the words may feel a little, bit, a little bit awkward in their tone of voice, but just remember that it's, it's them channeling Steve. I will not make you wear the blazer and tie. <laughs> Thank you for the honor of speaking to you today about one of my favorite topics the amazing and inspiring contributions that the women of Framingham have made to the development and success of what I consider one of the most American of American towns. Women are the unsung heroes of the American story, 
Only recently has the important but too often neglected role of women in our nation's history been brought forward. Thanks to the National Women's Movement and such initiatives as the National Women's History Project, the National Women's History Museum in Washington, D.C., and the National Women's Hall of Fame at Seneca Falls, New York. The importance of these initiatives is well summarized, I think, by this statement from the National Women's History Museum. American women have been pioneers and partners in the fields of science, medicine, government law, education and social service, literature, philanthropy, the arts, sports, business, and in the nurture of family and community from before our nation was founded until today. Yet neither traditional female roles nor the women who push the boundaries of those roles have been systematically explored and acknowledged. The wonderful accomplishments by extraordinary women should be known by all and taught to our children. I certainly agree with that sentiment and applaud all efforts to bring greater attention to women's history in America. But what about on the community level? What about Framingham? Today, I would like to make the case that Framingham can take great pride in its women's history and advocate, to paraphrase the statement of the Women's History Museum, that the wonderful accomplishments by extraordinary women of Framingham should be known by all and taught to our children. I was intrigued by this idea of a Women's Hall of Fame. Besides the National Women's Hall of Fame, there were similar institutions for various states and regions or specializations I thought if this movement toward recognizing remarkable women continues, sooner or later there might be a Framingham Women's Hall of Fame. I believe our town's history is filled with women of great talent, ability, and strength. So I set out to see if I could think of 10 women from our history who I might nominate as the original inductees to such a hall. For some rules, Framingham has a history as a town that is older than the United States and as a plantation that goes back to the earliest days of colonial settlement. It's important to demonstrate that the historical contributions of the women of Framingham encompass our entire history and that excellent nominees may be found in every era. Also, I am limiting my nominees to women who are no longer with us, just like getting on a US postage stamp. <laughs> You need to have passed on to get on my list. I feel it's safer that way. And I'll let others nominate living women and let them work it out among themselves. <laughs> so to begin, for 18 years, Helen Lemoyne has been executive director at Leadership Metro West, a nonprofit organization that provides the region with informed and collaborative leaders. Helen is also a serial volunteer. <laughs> Currently, she serves on the boards of Amazing Things Art Center, the Metro West Chamber of Commerce, and the Middlesex Savings Bank Board of Corporators, as well as the advisory boards of the Metro West YMCA and Framingham Adult ESL. She was a member of the Framingham History Center Board for 14 years and was also an elected member of the Framingham Planning Board for nine years. I refer to her as Ms. Board Governance. In 2016, Helen received the Women Making History Now Award given by Framingham State University. Helen and her husband, Ken, live in an 18th century Framingham home where they've raised two grown children and now enjoy two grandchildren. And so Helen will begin our journey back into Framingham's history with the story of brave Mary Eames, pioneer. Thank you, Charlene. The theme of the 2003 National Women's History Month is Women Pioneering the Future. The term pioneer is applied to those who settled the wild frontiers of America, as well as those who made advancements in the arts, sciences, and other fields. Well, in Framingham, we have women of both types. As my first nominee, I am pleased to present to you a real American pioneer, Mary Eames. Mary Eames was born Mary Blanton in the early 17th century. She was a widow when she married Thomas Eames, a widow widower in 1662. They both had children by their previous marriages and together would have six more. In 1669, they moved from their relatively 
secure, relative security of the town of Sudbury to take advantage of better farmland to the southwest. This was in unincorporated territory owned by Thomas Danforth, who called his land Framingham Plantation after his native English village. But this land was on the edge of civilization, open to wilderness lands where the native people still lived. The Eames family was an American pioneer family, and Mary Eames, raising all those children, as well as working a large farm, was a true pioneer woman. And unfortunately, this family would pay the price that many families paid as the westward expansion clashed with the native inhabitants of the land. By 1676, the Eames farm was well established. A house and a large barn stood on a hill near Farm Pond called Mount Waite. The native Indian tribe under a chief named King Philip had begun a, a campaign of terror to rid the land of the English intruders. Outpost farms such as the Eames homestead were the most vulnerable. On February 1st of that year, while Thomas Eames was away getting soldiers to help him guard his farm, 11 warriors of King Philip's tribe attacked. Mary Eames valiantly defended herself, her family, and her farm, but Mary and at least three children were slain and three or more taken into captivity. Our history calls this the Eames Massacre. But as Mary Eames did fight back, I prefer to call it the Battle of Mount Waite, <laughs> the only battle in our nation's history to be fought on Framingham soil, and it was waged by a woman. This alone earns Mary Eames a place in our Hall of Fame, but I present her to you as a pioneer, wife, mother, homesteader, as well as a defender of her American dream. Thank you, Helen. Through her own experiences of addiction and depression, Mal Duane has transformed her life and recreated herself as an awakened and highly successful businesswoman. Now she helps women through midlife transitions to heal their broken hearts, rec reclaim their lives, and build success where they never thought possible. A best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and coach, she has been featured on Fox News, CBS Radio, and over 250 radio internet shows, and is a contributor to Huffington Post, MariaShriver.com, Healthy Living, and Aspire Magazine. You can reach Mal on www.MalDwaneCoach.com. Please welcome Mal Duane, who is here to tell us a bit about a woman who lived on her street more than 350 years ago. Sarah Clay's 1638 to 1703, a Salem refugee. Mary Eames showed great courage in facing her assailants, and courage is a theme that runs through the women's history of Framingham. My next nominee, Sarah Clay's, was also a woman of remarkable courage. In her case, it was not the native people of Massachusetts that she had to stand up to, but her own neighbors who nearly had her hanged. Sarah Clays was born Sarah Town in 1638, probably in Salem. Like the Eameses, she and Peter Clays were both widowed when they married in 1682, combining large families. Sarah and her family were well settled into life at Salem Village when a new terror swept across the land. It was the witchcraft hysteria that held most of Essex County in its grip for most of the year of 1692. Salem Village was at the epicenter of the crisis. A gang of repressed Pubescent girls had taken control of a credulous, superstitious community. These girls discovered that their visions of certain women of the village were taken seriously by authorities. The women appearing in these visions were deemed to be witches subject to the capital laws of the colony. Sarah's older sister, Rebecca Nurse, was one such woman. 
according to legend, when the town minister started preaching about witches among them, Sarah abruptly got up and left the meeting house, slamming the door behind her. She was accused, indicted, and put in jail. And while in jail, she learned that her sister Rebecca and a younger sister, Mary Eastie, had both gone to their deaths at Gallows Hill. She would surely be next. But with the help of her husband, she managed to escape her jail and disappear into the night, only to reappear the next spring after the crisis had passed at a place called Framingham Plantation. And so, Sarah Clays, a refugee from terror and oppression, as would be so many refugees to America after her, began a new home on the frontier. With many other families from Salem, they founded the Salem End Community along Salem End Road. It was this group of families that opened the door for Framingham Plantation to become the town of Framingham seven years later in 1700. So in addition to the courage with which Sarah Clays stood up to the hysteria of Salem, I credit her as a founding mother of the town of Framingham, earning her a place in our Hall of Fame. Thank you, Mel. Our next presenter is so ubiquitous and such a familiar face in this community that there's a really good chance you are already acquainted. Susan Petroni is the owner of Petroni Media Company and the publisher editor of Framingham Source, a 24 hour online community news site considered by many to be the go to resource for all news Framingham. With a career in journalism that began at the age of 16, Susan is an award-winning writer, photographer, and editor who has won more than 100 newspaper and magazine awards, all of this while modeling a highly successful balancing act as a working mom, and for nearly 20 years supporting girls through the city as a troop leader, town-wide volunteer coordinator, and now program and media manager for Framingham Girl Scouts. Please welcome Susan, who is here to tell us about another of Framingham's documenters, Lydia Larned. The Framingham that Sarah Clays had helped bring about was run by men in a man's world. She could not vote a town meeting nor hold elective office. This is the way our civilization was back then and it would be for more than two centuries. During this time, the education of women was not considered of great importance, and by some, it was considered downright dangerous. It is therefore remarkable to find in the 18th century a woman of letters, even more so in a remote farming village as Framingham was at that time. But Framingham does have in its history such a woman, Lydia Leonard. Lydia Leonard was born in Framingham in 1730, the second of 11 children born to Moses and Lydia Leonard. Their farm was at the south end of a pond we know today as Leonard Pond. We know little of Lydia's formal education, but must suppose that she was self-taught, for the Framingham school system at that time offered little more than functional literacy, especially for girls. She became a school teacher herself and had a natural love of writing. She became, sorry, historian Josiah Temple described her as a voluminous writer in prose and verse, much of which was printed. That her work was published is most unusual in that time, as there were few printing presses in colonial America and certainly none in Framingham, and anything that was printed was usually by ministers or politicians, all men. Lydia wrote wonderful poems and serious religious treatises. When the community was shocked by the sudden death of two of its citizens by a bolt of lightning in 1777, she wrote a lengthy eulogy that was printed and widely circulated. 
It has so moved the families of the deceased that parts of it were inscribed on the headstones of the victims and can still be read in the old burial ground cemetery to this day. In my estimation, Lydia Learned sowed the first seeds of Framingham tradition that values education, a tradition that was carried on by the Framingham Academy, the State Normal School, and the model school system of the 20th century. And thus, she deserves a place in our Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you, Susan. Audrey Hall is a communications consultant and is the executive producer and host of the popular show which bears her name. The Audrey Hall Show goes beyond the headlines, putting people and topics into greater context, airing three times weekly on RCN, Comcast, and Verizon. Ms. Hall served as the Corporate Director of Product Marketing for Continental Cablevision. She was the first female general manager for Cablevision, overseeing operations in Massachusetts, and the first female general manager of the NPR station, WICN Radio. She was a Framingham Town Meeting member for 19 years and the first female chair of the Ways and Means Committee serving for 12 years. Years. In her consulting practice, she advises businesses and political candidates on overall communication strategies, branding and messaging, and has most recently served as the Director of Communications for the Yvonne Spicer for Framingham Mayor Campaign. Hannah Gleason Nixon, 1744 to 1831, she was a Minuteman wife. American history glorifies the many men who fought in the wars to make this country great, but it actually pays very little attention to the women, the women who were left behind, who kept the home fires burning, tending to business, raising families, and keeping the community together after the men marched off to war. So I would like to include in our Hall of Fame a woman who represents the wives who had to carry on back home and all too often found themselves as a widow when it was all over. The woman from Framingham's history who best meets these criteria is Hannah Gleason. Hannah Gleason Nixon. She was born Hannah Drury in Framingham in 1744 and married Micah Jack Gleason about 1763. They lived on a part of the main county road that is now called Old Connecticut Path, and they had two daughters. When the troubles with Great Britain began, Micah Joe was elected captain of one of Framingham's two companies of Minutemen. When the Revolutionary War began in Ernst, Micah Joe went off to serve in the Continental Army. Hannah decided to take advantage of the location of their farm, and she opened their house as a tavern. And to the surprise of many, the tavern actually made a profit. Micah J. Gleason was killed in the Battle of White Plains. Now a war widow, it might be expected that Hannah would be reluctant to marry a military man. But that's exactly what she did. The war was still raging when she agreed to marry John Nixon, another captain of Minutemen who had risen to the rank of general in the Continental Army. He himself was a widower with young children of his own, and they needed a mother, and Hannah, she did own a tavern. What more would a soldier want? <laughs> and so I offer Hannah Gleason Nixon, the wife of a, two heroes of the American Revolution, a war widow, and an enterprising businesswoman as a deserving nominee for our Hall of Fame. Thank you, Audrey. Courtney Thrain is Executive Director of Downtown Framingham, Inc., a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to building business, community, and culture. A U.S. Navy veteran, she also has professional experience in higher education at Boston University and in federal government with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Courtney holds a master's degree in public policy from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and a master's degree in city planning from Boston University. In her work for the greater downtown Framingham community, she partners with other nonprofit organizations in arts, education, environment, and family support to better overachieve overlapping missions. Please welcome Courtney Thrain, who is here to present a few details about a woman who pioneered manufacturing right in downtown Framingham, Mary Rice. Thank you, Charlene. Mary Rice 
1762 to 1855, industry founder. Hannah Gleason Nixon also represented a tradition in our history of women skilled in business. And that tradition really took off in the 19th century when our new nation was free to expand into new and exciting business ventures. In Framingham, one woman who demonstrated that spirit of American entrepreneurship to its fullest potential was Mary Rice, founder of a major Framingham industry. Mary Rice was born Mary Eames in 1762, a descendant of the early settler Thomas Eames. She married Captain Uriah Rice in 1784 and had three daughters. They lived at Rice's End on Old Connecticut Path near Concord Street. About 1800, a new fashion in women's headgear was spreading from England. It was called the Dunstable Bonnet, and it was made of straw. As an imported article, it was too expensive for poor farming families to afford. But Mary Rice was among the first women in the New England area to realize that such bonnets could easily be made right here from good old American straw. So she and her three daughters got to work, raising winter rye, cutting it, splitting it, and braiding it into lawn ribbons that were then sewed into the shape of bonnets in various sizes and designs. They were an instant hit. Mary Rice had founded a cottage industry that was taken up by many families in Framingham and eventually moved into factories and was the major manufacturing business of Framingham by the 1850s. And Mary Rice kept good business records. In her own hand, she described her first year. We began working on straw bonnets and trimmings on October 2nd, 1800, and cleared $340. Not bad for a startup. <laughs> she stayed in this business for 50 years, retiring at the age of 88. I fully recommend Mary Rice the founder of Framingham's first major manufacturing business for our Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you. Since retiring from her career as a registered nurse, Elsa Hornfisher has served on the boards of several arts and cultural organizations in Framingham, including Access Framingham TV, Framingham Downtown Renaissance, and the Framingham History Center. She was part of the Framingham Cultural Council team that co-founded the Framingham Start Partnership to strengthen the Framingham arts community. The group was soon honored by the Mass Cultural Council as one of three towns in Massachusetts to be given financial as well as consulting support. Elsa also represented Precinct 13 as a town meeting member for several terms and has lived in Framingham for the past 34 years. Please welcome Elsa Hornfisher who will tell us a bit about the Framingham inventor who was recently featured in an episode of Mysteries at the Museum. Thank you for organizing this day. I think it's done a lot to um, make us see more what so many people have done. Um, Margaret E. Knight was born in 1839, and she lived until 1914. She was an inventor, which is quite a title that you might not have found too many of. It's an awkward sentence, but uh, I think you understand. Um, in that time, Framingham's business history has always been tied to developments in technology. And the history of technology in America is also the history of invention. America has many great inventors, and this too seems to have been a domain of men for the most part. But there have been many women inventors, and one of them was also a Framingham woman, Margaret Elizabeth Knight. Margaret Knight was not a Framingham native. I kind of bond with her a little bit because I'm not either, but I love this community. Um, she was born in Manchester, New Hampshire in 1839. Manchester is a very famous mill town, and Margaret, like so many girls of that town, worked in the mills. I also bonded with her about this because my grandmother was a mill girl in Holyoke, Massachusetts. 
Her natural talent for understanding all things mechanical and the, merry, and the many horrible accidents that she witnessed in the mills up in New Hampshire led her to invent several safety devices that became standard to textile making equipment. Soon she was devoting all of her time to inventing mechanical devices for a wide variety of applications. She moved her office and lab to Boston, but decided to be a Framingham commuter, and I thought that was really quite progressive. Um, she probably started it, <laughs> the movement. In 1839, she rented a house on Hollis Street from the Curry family. The house still stands with a sign outside of it. She was already a well-established inventor at that time. In 1874, one, she had received a patent for the machine that makes, you ready for this, flat bottom paper bags, and we're still using them today. Her 87, 87 patent inventions include an improved tin can for better storage, shoemaking machinery, machines for processing cotton and rubber, steam engines, gas engines, and even a rotary engine. But the thing that surprised me when I, when I learned about her was her last invention was an automobile engine. Now that's pretty progressive. The Silent Night Motor, it was called, invented shortly before her death in 1914 at the age of 70, uh, 75. <clears throat> And so, as a pioneer in the field of technical advancement carried on in Framingham by such names as Denison, International Engineering, and Bose, I nominate Margaret Knight to our Women's Hall of Fame. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Cheryl Tully Stoll currently serves as city councilor at large in Framingham's new city government, representing all the residents and businesses of the city. She's a graduate of the Framingham Public Schools, holds a BA in economics from Framingham State University, and an MBA from Bentley University. She's the only woman ever elected to two terms as chairman of the Framingham Board of Selectmen in the 317 year history of the town. In addition to four years of holding elected office in Framingham, she has contributed over 35 years years of volunteer service to the community. Please welcome Cheryl Tully Stoll, who joins us to share a bit about Framingham suffragette Louise Parker Mayo. Thank you, Charlene. Louise Mayo, 1868 to 1952, suffragette. One of the most important events in our national women's history was opening of the voting franchise to half of this nation's population, its women. An event that culminated with the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And the women of Framingham were active in that effort. To represent these women and to honor her own personal sacrifice for that cause, I would like to nominate suffragette Louise Mayo. Louise Mayo was born Louise Parker in 1868. As a mother of seven, living up on Nixon Road, she felt so strongly about the issue of women's rights that she joined the local chapter of the Equal Suffrage League. With encouragement from the new and more militant National Women's Party, she put aside many of the responsibilities of family life to travel to Washington in July of 1917 to picket the White House. Unjustly arrested and sentenced to 60 days along with 16 other women, Mrs. Mayo endured two days in jail before a pardon came from President Wilson. That event received national attention and moved this nation closer to embracing the idea of voting rights for all Americans. The National Women's Party recognized the special sacrifice that Louise Mayo made for the cause by awarding her and others who were imprisoned for their beliefs with small pins in the shape of a jail door. We are very fortunate to have Louise Mayo's jail door pin in the collection of the Historical Society. And thanks to the efforts of Laurie Evans Daly, 
Silver reproductions were made, and I am proud to be wearing one of them today. And so, as a leading suffragist of Framingham, I am pleased to place the name of Louise Mayo in our Hall of Fame. Thank you, Cheryl. So we're gonna break from Steve's script for a moment. Um, as I had explained at the beginning of this program, we sought public nominations um, for women who would be added to Steve Herring's list of 10 to turn it into a dozen. And one name came up repeatedly, um, so much in connection with Louise Parker Mayo, and um, also because Libby Frank had done so much to bring about Josephine Collins' history um, and her story, which frankly, when Steve did the talk in 2003, that information really was not well known. So we can't fault Stephen um, for not having Josephine Collins on his list, but we're putting her on there right now. And to present, um, Josephine Collins' story, I'd like to introduce you to Carol Kane, her great niece. Carol Kane was born and raised in Framingham, as were her parents, Mary and Warren Kane. She attended Framingham Public Schools and was a Framingham State graduate, a Framingham Girl Scout through and through. It was Carol's idea to create the Mayo Collins Square in front of the Edgel Memorial Library, a project that she saw to fruition with the help of Mary Murphy. Please welcome Carol Kane. Josephine Collins was born August 5, 1879, a selfless single woman who put family and equality before all else. She was a successful businesswoman in her own right, opening a tea room on the corner of Pleasant Street and Belknap Road, a dry goods shop, and her own periodical shop in Frame, South Framingham's SD building. In later years, she worked as a bookkeeper for Babson College. Josephine Collins was my mother's aunt, and to me, she was Aunt Jo. <laughs> Josephine led a remarkable life. She was deeply involved in the suffrage movement that contributed to the passing of the 19th Amendment. On February 24th, 1919, Josephine was part of a demonstration returning part of a demonstration picketing President Woodrow Wilson when he stopped in Boston after returning from the Paris Peace Conference. She was arrested and sentenced to 18, eight days in the Charles Street Jail. She gave her name as Jane Doe, as did all the women who were arrested with her. Yeah. Josephine joined a hunger strike, and after a few days, she was released from jail when an anonymous donor put up her bail. The anonymous donor was one of her brothers, and Josephine was not happy to be released. Josephine was recognized for her sacrifice with a Jail for Freedom pin that she and all of the other women who had been jailed received from the National Women's Party. She was presented with this pin at the Tremont Theater in Boston in 1919. Aunt Jo's pin found a new home when it was donated to the History Center several years ago. I'm proud to be wearing a replica of that pin myself. Josephine Collins is my hero. She sacrificed for her family, she sacrificed for me, and she sacrificed for all of you. I am so proud to include the name of my great aunt, Josephine Collins, in Framingham Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Margaret Shepherd is an active member of the Massachusetts Brazilian immigrant community. She's been assisting green card holders with citizen applications, young students with Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA applications, and promoting civil engagement. In Framingham, she served as town meeting member, as Framingham Democratic Town Committee Treasurer, and as Board Secretary of the Brazilian American Center, also known as BRACE. In the past year, she also became a commissioner for the Metro West Commission on the Status of Women. In 2016, 
2016, Margaret co-founded the movement Brazilians for Political Education, which, which was created to help members of the Brazilian and other communities learn how to be politically active and engaged. In 2017, she successfully ran for city council in Framingham, becoming the first Brazilian American citizen to be elected for a government position in the United States. Margaret joins us today to read Herring's bio for Mita Fuller. Thank you. Meta Warwick Fuller, artist and sculptress. I have recognized from him women as pioneers, leaders in business and technology, and bringers of social change. But I do not want to neglect the arts. We have had many fine female artists in Framingham, and the artists that I would choose to nominate to our Hall of Fame would be Meta Warwick Fuller. Born in Philadelphia as Meta Vals Warwick in 1878, Meta Fuller received an education in art in Philadelphia and in Paris. With encouragement from famed French sculptor, Auguste Rudin, she launched a career in an internationally recognized sculptures of subjects with African and slavery themes. She returned to the United States and married Dr. Solomon Fuller in 1909. In her studio on Warren Road, Mrs. Fuller worked on various commissions and taught classes in sculpture. A bit of her work was mounted in Washington, D.C. in the early 1930s. Mrs. Fuller received an honorary Doctor of Letters degree from Livingstone College in 1962. She was a active in Framingham civic organizations, and many of her works were done for the benefit of this town. On January 17, 1995, the Framingham School Committee voted unanimously to name the new middle school on Flag Drive, formerly Framingham South High School, to Fuller Middle School in memory of Dr. Solomon Fuller and his wife, Meta Warwick Fuller. I would now extend that honor by name Meta Fuller to our Women's Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Margaret. Betty Funk began her 43-year career as the executive director of the Greater Framingham Mental Health Association, where she provided leadership to form a statewide association of community mental health providers, of which she is the immediate past president and CEO. She was an active elected regional representative to the Washington-based National Council and served on its board and chair of the board. Betty is a founder of Advocates, Inc., a Framingham-based behavioral health program. Motivated by improving access to great services, Betty's community roles have included leadership in the League of Women Voters, Framingham Union Hospital Board, Metro West Medical Center, and Metro West Health Boards, Framingham Historical Commission, Framingham History Center, and the Danforth Museum. She was an active 34-year elected town meeting member and chaired and served on the appointed finance committee for the past 11 years. Betty has an MBA from the Simmons College Graduate School of Management and continues to share the preservation of their historic home and barn with her husband, Ralph, and ever-growing family. Betty joins us to recite a few details about Dr. Miriam Van Waters. Thank you very much, Joanne. How many people here have ever been in the prison, the women's prison in Framingham? Oh, I'm so proud of all of you. Thank you. Dr. Miriam Van Waters, uh, 1887 to 1974, as a reformer. <clears throat> the women's history of Framingham would be incomplete without mentioning the fact 
that Framingham is the home of the only women's prison in Massachusetts, MCI Framingham. This prison came about in the 19th century as an act of social reform to protect women from the male inmate population. This idea of social reform was advanced at the prison by a succession of women superintendents, including Red Cross founder Clara Barton, but was probably taken to its highest point by Dr. Miriam Van Waters. She was born in Oregon in 1887 to a pioneer family that valued social equity, and she received her doctorate from Clark University in Worcester in 1913. Miriam Waters was recognized author of books on juvenile crime when she was appointed superintendent of MCI Framingham in 1932. She gained a national reputation for her progressive management of the prison, where she referred to inmates as students and developed programs to rehabilitate them as useful citizens. This reputation attracted the attention of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who visited the prison and addressed the inmates. In 1948, these reforms came under attack by more punishment-oriented officials. Public hearings in Boston put her whole career on trial. Leading citizens of Framingham stepped forward and courageously supported Dr. Van Waters, helping to secure her vindication and allowing her to keep running the prison as she saw fit until her retirement in 1957. She's been the subject of two biographies, the latest in 1998, entitled Maternal Justice. As a social reformer and one who stood up to those who would destroy her work, I heartily recommend Dr. Miriam Van Waters to the Framingham Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you, Betty. A Framingham resident since 1985, Dr. Yvonne Spicer grew up in Brookline, New York. By the age of 23, she earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Arts and Education and a Master of Science degree in Technology Education. She started a teaching career in Framingham and rose to department chair before accepting a leadership position in the Newton District, where she led initiatives to involve business leaders, colleges, and universities in new programs. She continued her education, earning a Doctorate of Education in 2004 at UMass Boston, and was awarded an honorary Doctor of Humanities degree by the Mass College of Liberal Arts. In 2007, Yvonne was asked to start a new division at the Museum of Science in Boston. She became the Vice President for Advocacy and Educational Partnerships. In this startup role, she developed partnerships with policymakers, municipalities, business leaders, education institutions, and nonprofit organizations. Governor Deval Patrick appointed her to the inaugural Massachusetts STEM Advisory Council, to which she was reappointed by Governor Charlie Baker in 2017. She is a committee member of the Mass Business Roundtable and an advisory board member of the Massachusetts State Treasurer's Economic Empowerment Trust Fund. She's a former advisor to the National Governors Association as well as a Framingham Town Meeting member representing Precinct 6 and serving on the Ways and Means Committee. Mayor Dr. Yvonne Spicer joins us today to talk about a fellow former educator with a kindred spirit. Good afternoon. Krista Corrigan McAuliffe. Steve Herring's final nominee brings us into the space age. As you can see, I dressed appropriate for the occasion. <laughs> but in a way, this woman represents a culmination of the contributions made by all of these Framingham women that came before her. Krista McAuliffe was a pioneer, a woman of courage, advancing technology, promoting education, ultimately a position as a woman in a traditionally male dominant. Born in Boston as Sharon Krista Corrigan in 1948, her parents were a part of the great post-World War II migration to the suburbs. Coming to Framingham in the 1950s, her mother Grace Corrigan lived most recently on Joseph Road. She graduated from Marion High School, then went on to prepare for teaching career at Framingham State. Graduating in 1970, she married attorney Steve McCullough, 
had two children and was a social studies teacher at Concord High School in Concord, New Hampshire. On July 19, 1985, Krista McAuliffe was selected from a field of 10,000 candidates to be America's first astronaut, teacher astronaut. She became an international celebrity overnight. She was assigned to the seven-member crew of NASA Shuttle Mission 51-L, a 97-orbit voyage abroad space shuttle Challenger. The Challenger disaster of January 28, 1986, put Krista McAuliffe's celebrity in a whole new light. She became a true American hero. The town of Framingham honored her by naming the Saxonville Branch Library after her. Framingham State established the Krista Corrigan McAuliffe Center for Education and Teaching Excellence, and later the Challenger Learning Center. Today, Krista McAuliffe words appear large, shining letters over the stage at Framingham State College, main interest in the Dwight Auditorium. I touch the future. I teach. And so, as the model of Framingham's women of the past and of the future, I complete the 2003 nomination with the name Krista McAuliffe. Thank you, Mayor. Well, you've heard um, 10 great, no, you've heard 11 great stories from 11 great women. Everybody learned something here today? Yeah. Okay. So um, I want to thank all of our presenters who were here uh, to help me share the story of Framingham's um, nominated women according to Steve Herring plus Josephine Collins. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, um, we wanted to do something fun for this year and so we sought nominations from the public um, to get that number from 10 up to 12, which would have been a daring dozen, um, but we did add in Josephine Collins ad automatically, so now it's a, a daring baker's dozen. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should have received a handout if you don't. Um, unfortunately for today's program, we don't have the time to go through and read each, each nomination that came in, but you have them to take home with you. There is more information on our website as well. Um, I know that there are people in the audience here who, who might have something that they want to share about one, one or two of the nominees. Um, and if there is something that you would like to um, add on, if you, we could ask you to come to the podium. It's just better for uh, film and for the rest of the audience to be able to hear you. If you'd like to share something about um, one of the nominees. I think Libby um, mentioned that she had something wonderful to share, which is always a treat. I would like to read just a little bit of Edna Dean Proctor's poem about our town of Framingham. This was written in 1900 when the town was celebrating its bicentennial. Home to the Nipmucks was Framingham, when deer were plenty and salmon swam, by Merrimack west to Sudbury River and the brooks that wind where the tall reeds quiver, and only the wind or the wolf or the loon broke the silence at night or noon. Yet was Shakem, Cochituit, Knobscot Hill, speak of their old dominion still. And now two hundred years have fled, but the men of Framingham, living and dead, have been true to country and state and town, winning in war and peace renown. And her sons in Manila and Cuba still are brave as the soldiers of Bunker Hill, and her daughters as loyal through weal and woe as the wives and mothers of long ago. Fairer and nobler is Framingham than in far off days when the salmon swam, for the toil of two centuries makes at their close the wilderness bloom 
and rejoice as they rose. With the bustling south to a city growing and traffic and life through the highways flowing, with the center charming it, with lawns and leaves, for homes and rivers and stately trees. With busy, beautiful Saxonville, queen of the falls, the lake, the mill, Region of loveliness, thrift, and cheer is the town in its bright 200th year. And while Cachituit mirrors the sky, and over Washakum the west winds sigh, while her churches rise and her heart fires glow, in strength and honor may Framingham grow, and forever the Bay State's lovely crown with trade and prosperity a town of renown. Go, Edna! <laughs> Thank you, Libby. If there is any other comment? Hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be visiting the big city from little old Sherburne. <laughs> um, it was my interest in Mrs. Kitson that got me to join the Sherburne Historical Society and then the Framing History Center, although I haven't been a very active member here. But I nominated uh, Mrs. Kitson because I thought she was a pioneer too, even though you already had me to work fuller. Um, because uh, after her early proficiency in sculpture was demonstrated, she went on to study in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And while there, she submitted some work to the Paris Salon that the school put on. And that was a big deal art event. And she won honorable mention. And she was the first American woman to receive that honor. And then uh, back in the United States, when the National Sculpture Society formed in 1893, uh, in New York City. She was the first woman to be a member of the society, which is what I, I think that's right, 1895. I read something else that she was one of the founding members, but I won't give her that much. And then, um, and then she married Mr. Kitson, and um, they were together uh, in Boston, and they had three children. They moved to Quincy, and uh, then they separated in uh, 1909, so when she was 38, she became a single mother, working mother with three children. And uh, then over the course of her career, she really got a lot of work doing war memorials, which I don't think are the most popular things these days, but she um, uh, worked a lot for the Vicksburg Military Park down in Mississippi and did over 60 busts and reliefs and statues. She did uh, a Civil War memorial that was replicated in is located in over 10 places around the country. And the Spanish-American War veterans loved her hiker statue, and there are over 54 of those around the country. After the Kitson separated, she stayed on in Quincy for a while, and then she moved to Sherburne in a house that's no longer standing on Western Avenue. And then um, in 1926, she moved to Framingham, and she lived in the Dennett House over on Gate Street, kind of near the Staples area there. And I think she moved because the Sherburne property uh, she had a fall out of in the barn, and I think the space didn't work for her. That's my guess as to why she moved. And while she was in Framingham, I thought you might be interested to know that she did uh, three uh, statues that are in the area. She did Thaddeus Kosciuszko on the Boston Public Garden, a Polish man who came here and helped in the Revolutionary War and designed the plans for the West Point um, fortifications. She also helped with her husband on the Watertown Memorial, which consists of a big uh, nine-foot bronze statue of Richard Saltonstall, and also two big bronze reliefs on a big granite exedra of two of the founding um, events of Watertown history. And then the third statue, she did an equestrian that's in Hingham Harbor off Route 3A. You can see it when you drive down. And um, so uh, those were pretty big works, and she, um, and also, I, I read that um, she'd even written some columns in the Boston Globe favor promoting women's education. And so for someone who didn't go to college and right as a teenager went into just the trade of sculpting, I thought she did very well for herself. <laughs> Thank you, Martha, for sharing that. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> um, anything else to share? Um, otherwise, I think we're going to move forward and, and talk about 
uh, the winners of our voting. So um, here you have the, the women that were nominated um, through the Framingham History Center. And um, what we did was we encouraged public voting. We had over 300 people vote, which was pretty good um, turnout for that, I thought. And we will be adding two women um, to create our Daring Baker's Dozen. <laughs> Annie Murphy has been the executive director of the Framingham History Center since 2005 when she immediately saw the need for a campaign to save the Edgell Memorial Library, the old academy, and the Village Hall from demolition by neglect. She was part of a team that negotiated a 50-year lease where the FHC would become stewards of these buildings. One of the many highlights of her efforts was when she galvanized residents of Framingham and beyond to vote for the Edgell Library in a National Trust for Historic Preservation competition that resulted in a $100,000 grant to restore the windows at the Edgell Library. Annie truly believes that an understanding of local history fosters strong community connections, and she has worked diligently to create programs, exhibitions, and celebrations to showcase Framingham's incredibly rich past. I'd like you all to welcome Annie Murphy, who is here to talk about one of the winners of our voting, Dr. Mary Murphy. Okay. Hello, everybody. Okay. How many of you knew Mary Murphy? How many of you didn't know Mary Murphy? <laughs> Not many of you. So in any case, um, she was my mother-in-law. <laughs> and she got me involved with Framingham History when about 16 years ago, she asked me to join the History Center board saying, we need young people on the board. <laughs> I've been the director for the last 13 years, and now I'm saying we need more young people on the board. <laughs> um, it's possible, it was impossible to go anywhere in Framingham with Mary without bumping into one of her students from Framingham State. She taught English there for 40 years. She was a beloved teacher and mentor. She defined the word activist and mentored men and women in the political realm as well. Some of you may not know about her early political career, and I thought I would share what I learned about her when the Framingham History Center put together a program called Framingham Citizen Activist, 1968 to 1971. It was inspired by this poster um, that I found in Mary's basement, along with a lot of other things. Um, and I wanted to learn more about what was going on in Framingham in, during the 60s. I found out a lot about Mary that I hadn't known when she was alive. I knew she was at the 1968 Democratic Convention, but I hadn't known that she ran unsuccessfully as a Eugene McCarthy delegate. She was still able to go, though, as she was invited by the Massachusetts delegation. Her husband, Phil, was Jean McCarthy's press secretary, and she'd grown close to the senator. I'd heard this story about her traveling with the McCarthy campaign and was thrilled to find a 2004 Metro West Daily News article entitled, Political Enthusiasts Remember When the Region Was a Hotbed of Campaigning, and of course Mary was featured throughout. And I quote, in 1968, Senator Eugene McCarthy's presidential campaign sent a handful of people from Metro West on the road. Pulitzer Prize winning Robert, sorry, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Robert Lowell joined McCarthy and Murphy on the plane headed to Oregon. The poet soon became annoyed that McCarthy asked M Murphy to sit next to him. He leaned over and he said, what does she know that I don't know? And McCarthy responded, she knows as much as you about poetry and a lot more about politics. <laughs> <laughs> The McCarthy campaign inspired Mary to run for state representative in 1968. She called her campaign the People's Lobby. It evolved from the New Politics Movement. New Politics was born amid the Democratic Party's crisis in 1968, and it grew together, it drew together activists from anti-war, civil rights, feminist struggles, as well as the labor left. New politics diagnosed the limits and failures of democratic policies as the product of an insufficiently democratic party. Hmm. 
Okay. She ran a daring campaign against a Republican incumbent as well as other established figures in town. What amazed me most reading about the campaign was that she was seen as not having political experience, really? She was a town meeting member. She was active in the League of Women Voters. She was the director of the Framingham Union Hospital Aid Association, president of the Framingham Catholic Women's Club, president of the Jonathan Maynard PTA, and we all know how political those come <laughs> down. And she helped her Trinity College friend, Polly Fitzgerald, set up teas for young Jack Kennedy at Nevins Hall when he was running for the Senate. Apparently, this activity was seen as community involvement. It wasn't political. But she was not a lawyer, held no political office, and she was a woman. At the time, there were only six women out of 240 state representatives. She'd hoped to appeal to those who, quote, felt that the overwhelming majorities of men trained in the law and legislatures give those bodies a particularistic, non-sociological frame of mind in approaching problems of sociology and even social psychology, as well as other fields, especially education, where they have had no professional or academic training. As you might imagine, Mary was an unconventional candidate. Framingham wasn't ready for a people's lobby in 1968, but Mary was ahead of her time as the new politics did have an impact on the Democratic Party, and as so many of you know, she was a party stalwart. She was active in state and town Democratic committees and attended the national conventions in San Francisco in 1980 and New York in 84. There wasn't a day that went by when I was visiting her when someone didn't call asking for her endorsement or for political advice. She knew more about pop culture than I did when my children were coming of age and she had incredibly strong convictions. There was no divide between principle and practice, between here I go. <laughs> Between what Mary said and what she did. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. To talk about our final winner, um, I'd like to introduce you all to Debbie Cleveland. Debbie has been a neighborhood activist, local volunteer, and freelance writer specializing in history, antiques, and vintage clothing. Her articles have appeared in The Antique Trader, Antique Week, and the New England Antiques Journal, among others. She co-founded New England's first vintage clothing show, the Greater Saxonville Neighborhood Association, and the Friends of Saxonville. She served for seven years on the Metro West MWRA Tunnel Working Group. She was nominated for Metro West Woman of the Year and designated a hometown hero by the Middlesex News. She formerly owned Framingham.com and recently started a small publishing company, Grandmother's Trunk Press. Her daytime job is as the executive director of the Independent Association of Framingham State Alumni, a nonprofit that provides scholarships and services to students and alumni. She's been a longtime volunteer of the Framingham History Center and is currently on the Collections Committee. She approached Barbara Gray about helping her write her memoir because she was concerned that the backstory of how women's rights and political clout were advanced significantly during Barbara's 24 years in the State House would be forgotten and lost. Here to talk about Barbara Gray, please welcome Debbie Cleveland. When Charlene asked me to talk a little bit about Barbara, my response was, oh, Mary Murphy would have been the one to do it. And I'm so sorry that Mary isn't here. And then I thought, what about one of Barbara's longtime friends, like Betty Funk, who once said, Barbara's barn has been the control center for her takeover of Framingham. <laughs> now, many of you obviously knew her well because, once again, she won an election. So. I'd like to read a couple of comments from the media and from her associates, which capture her impact and, I think, her essence. The Middlesex News wrote, one of the state's most able, knowledgeable, and principled lawmakers. 
the Framingham tab said, a pioneer in working to get our justice system to help women who are victims of domestic violence. And the Boston Globe had many comments, one I chose, a no-nonsense proponent of human services and environmental protections. Marty Frank dubbed her the holy pest of good causes. <laughs> And she and insisted she was an advocate for things before they became popular. Tom Riley, former Attorney General, said, Barbara Gray challenged us to listen and listen to the victims of domestic violence and improve our services and the way we conduct ourselves. Senator Ed Markey recalled, when I met Barbara in the Massachusetts State Legislature in 72, it was a bastion of white males and Irish that were Irish and Italian politicians. Every one of us had our consciousness raised like an elevator by Barbara, and we are all better men for it. Now those were serious comments, but on the lighter side because she had one. Talk show host Howie Carr called her the crazy lady of Metro West, <laughs> which he took in stride. When talking about Barbara and her two aides, State House reporter Leslie Miller said, Thelma and Louise and Louise take the State House. <laughs> Former State Senator Dave Magnani said, they'll have to expand the State House library to hold a portion of her bills the rest will be stored in Shea Stadium. <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted, and certainly be applied to Barbara Gray, and a daring woman, definitely. After moving to Framingham in the 50s, she helped start the League of Women Voters. She won a seat on the planning board that had been a male bastion back then. She dared to run for state rep in the 70s, when there were only about seven women in the state house. She dared to introduce bills on oft-times touchy subjects, especially then, and they still are today, pro-choice, gay rights, battered women's syndrome, elderly abuse, no-fault divorce, and many, many more. She dared to engage in exchanges with talk show hosts Jerry Williams and Howie Carr. She, she said, bring them on. She dared to chase the mass speaker of the house up and down the state house steps insisting, I gotta have this bill, I gotta have this bill, whatever the bill was then. She did face down powerful interest groups, such as the American Motorcyclist Association, as she filed legislation against requiring helmets. She dared to rock boats by filling anti-discrimination laws so that women could get credit cards in their own right, and women and shorter men could join police and fire departments. She did to introduce and reintroduce and reintroduce seatbelt law legislation despite death threats until the law was finally passed. She did to switch political parties and then win on a write-in campaign. And when she did that, former state rep and Democratic majority whip leader uh, Barbara Gardner commented, well, when she became a Democrat, it took her all of 15 minutes to get on the national news. <laughs> While she was a crusader, she wasn't the stony, solemn type. She dared to have fun. She had fun with her opponents in the press, and she approached all the obstacles with a ready sense of humor. Funny, brash, forthright, energetic, compassionate, robust, resilient, Womanly tough, engaging, frustrating, awesome, sometimes maddening. Nevertheless, she dared, she persisted, and we're a better city and state for it. Thank you, Debbie. So I just want to re-thank um, all of my presenters who have come today. I feel like I've spent the afternoon in greatness, past and present. And I hope everyone here has learned a little bit and will go off on your own tangent of research like I did so many years ago with Mita Fuller.
If you are not a member of the Framingham History Center, I implore you uh, to join us. It's, it's very easy, framinghamhistory.org. Uh, become a member, come to programs. We have a lot of fun learning about a lot of various topics of Framingham history. Um, I've been volunteering here for over 25 years and it's a really, it's a very valued piece of my life. So thank you for coming today. We do have refreshments on the side table. I hope you'll hang out for a little bit, have a snack uh, before you go out in the spring snow. <laughs> thank you.